Hello everyone, welcome to another session of Carvan Online History Festival Season 2. I'm Ishan Sharma and today I'm joined by an eminent historian and icon for many, Professor Richard M. Eaton, sir, all the way from Arizona, United Nations, uh, United States of America. Today, delivering a live lecture on the Sufis of Bujapur revisited the place of Sufism in India's history. So let me give you all a small introduction of our speaker, though he doesn't need one. So Professor Eaton has over a long and varied career published a number of groundbreaking books. First was the Sufis of Bijapur and the latest is India and the Passionate Age. And his major works are on the social roles, roles of Sufis, slavery, Indian biography, the growth of Muslim societies along Bengal's eastern frontiers, the social history of the Deccan, and the place of Islam in the continent's history. And today it is our honor to have him to speak on the Sufis of Bijapur Revisited. Thank you, sir. It's an honor and over to you. Well, thank you very much, Eshan. First of all, I want to say what a great pleasure it is to participate in this program that you students at Delhi have organized. Uh, it's a pleasure, it's also an honor. Uh, I have very many pleasant memories of, of visiting your campus and uh, speaking at, at, uh, at Delhi University. So anyway, <coughs> I, I'd like to start today by <coughs> giving you some idea of, um, <coughs> of why I wrote this book and what I was trying to do. Uh, <coughs> basically, I've always been interested in the question of religious change or conversion. And I wanted to understand, how do we explain conversion to Islam in India? And why does it occur in some parts of South Asia, but not in other parts of South Asia? And so when I ask this question, I talk to colleagues and I read books, and everyone seems to agree that, well, if you want to study conversion to Islam, then you have to study the Sufis, because that's what they did. They were the responsible, primarily responsible for that. So I... I said, okay, fine, that's what I'll do. I'll, I'll go out and read books on, on, uh, on Sufism. And, uh, <clears throat> and my plan was to pick out one part of India where I had it was somewhat manageable. So I picked out the, the Sultanate of Bijapur, which had a, a rich history of its own, uh, well documented in narrative chronicles. Uh, and I happened to discover a reference at the University of Wisconsin Library to an unpublished Persian manuscript, the uh, the title Rosat al Ulaya Bijapur, Bijapur, which means the the biographies of the saints of Bijapur, and this manuscript was was in the Asafiya State Library in Hyderabad, one copy. And so, uh, I got a grant, I got a ticket, uh, I fly to India, and I go down to Hyderabad. Uh, and I go into the library, and they, they bring out from the darkness and the gloom uh, this very manuscript. The problem, was, the problem was it was written in very, very uh, bad handwriting. So I hired a, a katib, a scribe, to make a, a, a true copy of, of this manuscript. And I began reading it, and uh, it was quite extraordinary. I uh, made a number of discoveries when I read the uh, this this. this collection of biographies of the Sufis of Bijapur. The first thing I noticed was that it did not seem to matter uh, what order they belonged to, which is to say what tariqa or brotherhood. Most books on Sufism categorize Sufis by whether they belong to the Qadri order, the Chishti order, the Naqshbandiya, the Shatari, uh, and so, the Suharwadiya, and so forth. That did my, made no sense at all. Uh, these Sufis could belong to any order, and they were all pretty much involved in similar activities in terms of their, their thought. The second thing I discovered when I read this manuscript, and others, is a, this manuscript, of course, led me to other manuscripts that were similar to it, that were, that, that were used as, a, as sources for this manuscript. The second thing I discovered was that these Sufis did not seem to be interested in converting anybody to Islam. That completely overthrew my, my underlying premise. The whole reason to undertake the study seemed to be undermined 
uh, by the very fact that nobody, there was no evidence that these Sufis were engaged with the Hindu population, uh, no evidence that they were concerned with converting these people to, to the Islamic faith. And this surprised me because of all the literature uh, that seemed to be pointing in this, 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 uh, that direction. So rather than abandon the whole project, I decided I'm going to stick with the Sufis of Bijapur, but instead of thinking about conversion to Islam, I'm going to actually ask the question, what did they do? Who were they as social actors? Right? Um, in other words, I wanted to write a social history of Sufis rather than the uh, usual approach, which, to, which is to look at them as mystical figures who are lost in mystical thought. We have dozens, if not hundreds, of books written on Sufism as a mystical philosophy. You think of all the books on Ibn Arabi, or Jalaluddin Rumi, or Nizamuddin Ulia, or, or, or all of these, these famous Sufis, most of which are written uh, from the standpoint of their thought and the, the mystical path um, that they preached. And I decided I want to study who were these people as, as actually flesh and bone human beings. What was their social role? How did they behave in society? And specifically, how did they respond or act with respect to the Islamic clergy or the ulama? Uh, how did they respond to the court in Bijapur? Uh, and what evidence is there of their interaction with the non-Muslim population, the Hindus of Bijapur? So as I read these, all these accounts of biographies, and it wasn't just this first one, but it, it, it snowballed and I kept finding more and more and more uh, chronicles and biographies. And then of course, writings of the Sufis themselves, uh, the, their conversations or Malfuzat literature, very substantial. It occurred to me that what's really interesting about them is the different kinds of social roles they seem to be playing. Um, and I, decided, therefore, to divide the book into five major chapters, each one devoted to one particular role or type of Sufi. The one role that, I, that was discussed in the literature was Sufis as warriors, uh, joining Muslim armies and, and becoming martyred sometimes. Those were very early. Uh, another one was Sufis as reformers, people who undertook the task of trying to influence the state or the court uh, in ways that they thought would be beneficial to the, to the Muslim community. A third role I've discovered uh, was Sufis who were primarily uh, literati or writers, authors of literature. And these uh, were, were very important figures as well. And I, I decided to use one chapter talking about what, what, what they were doing as writers. A fourth category was Sufis as gentry, as landed elites. To my surprise, I found that many of them became landlords, which is quite astonishing because you normally think of Sufis as people who abandon the world, not people who become, become involved in collecting land revenue uh, or rent from tenants. Uh, so I became interested in how that happened. How do you become a landlord if you're a Sufi? Uh, and then finally, I became interested in those Sufis who were, who were really did abandon the world, who did not belong to any institutional order, uh, who did not behave by the rules of organized society, uh, who, who dressed in rags and became really something like sannyasi, uh, abandoning, abandoning the world altogether. And uh, they were very interesting people. And I was interested in, in, in why do they appear when they appear. So Generally, then, those are the five types that I wanted to study, and I found that they more or less uh, could be distinguished by when, by time. And as I say, the, the warrior Sufis seem to be appearing early in the history of Bijapur. Uh, the reformers only appeared after there was an established state that needed to be reformed. The literati, or authors, appeared most all the time, at any time. The landed elites only appeared at the end of the of the of the uh, Bijapur Sultanate, 
Uh, and the dervishes also came at the very end when society was undergoing extreme stress uh, and ultimately collapse, of course, in 1686 when the Sultanate is conquered by Aurangzeb and the whole state is assimilated into the Mughal Empire. In short, I wanted to understand the connection between the life cycle of the state and the different kinds of roles that Sufis played in, the, in that society. Now, looking back on my book, uh, and this is where slide two comes. Slide two, there we go. This is just to simply show you the map and indicate uh, the Sultanate of Bijapur, of course, uh, one of the largest Sultanates of the Deccan Plateau in the, in the 16th, 17th uh, centuries. So what are some of my retrospective thoughts about this whole enterprise? Uh, well, the first thing I have to say uh, is re regarding uh, the, uh, the warrior saints. Now, here you want to pick slide number three. Slide three, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, the first category, chapter two, uh, was about Sufis as warriors. And uh, I had a number of these people, maybe a dozen. Uh, such as this Pir Ma'abadi Kandayat. Uh, he, for example, uh, is said to have reached Bijapur around 1311 uh, from uh, the Coromandel coast in, in South India. Uh, he is said to have accompanied Muslim armies, uh, probably Malik Kafur, the beginning of the, the Khalji uh, 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 invasions of, of South India. Um, and he's remembered as somebody who uh, waged jihad uh, smashing infidels with his iron bar. This is what we're told in the, in the sources. Uh, and he eventually was himself martyred and killed uh, in, in combat. Uh, now there are several others like him uh, which, which were interesting. Uh, but I, after I wrote the book, I realized there are fundamental problems with this whole category of warriors as Sufis. Um, one problem is that the Deccan Plateau was thought, at least when I was writing this book, to be divided between a Muslim north and a Hindu south. Uh, you had the Bahmani Sultanate uh, north of the Krishna River, and you had the, the Vijayanagara state to the south of the Krishna River. These two states indeed were enemies for a long time, uh, but many historians writing in the 1960s and 70s uh, conceived of the Deccan Plateau as split along the line of the Krishna River, uh, with Vijayanagara as this kind of Hindu bulwark against the, the, the menace of Islam. This is how people like Nilakant Shastri and, and Burton Stein and many other historians uh, wrote in this view. And I accepted all that. Uh, and the reason I invented the, this this category of Sufis as warriors is because they seem to fall precisely into this model of a Northern Deccan versus Southern Deccan, which is to say Islamic versus Hindu. Uh, and you have this polarized vision of the Deccan Plateau. Uh, and and uh, the, the difficulty of course is that I subsequently have come to understand that that entire model is wrong. <laughs> that you know, the Deccan Plateau was never harshly divided severely between a uh, in, a, in a binary division between the Muslim North and the Hindu South. Uh, that is something which is contradicted by evidence. As I studied more closely, in fact, I wrote two more books, <laughs> The Social History of the Deccan, and then uh, the book Power, Memory, and Architecture, co-authored with Phil Wagner, both of which argue for the Deccan Plateau as a much more fluid zone uh, where there's no evidence of a geographical divide. Uh, <clears throat> And the other problem with this whole model, and then I want to hear slide number four, please. Thank you. P. N. Oak, some of you might know this name, uh, a uh, author of several rather bizarre histories, such as the Taj Mahal as a Rajput Palace. Uh, he writes that uh, places like the, the Kaaba in Mecca uh, was a Shiva shrine, uh, as were Aztec temples in Mexico many other such wild theories. 
Well, he wrote me a letter, handwritten letter, on one of these blue aerograms, uh, shortly after my book was published, congratulating me for chapter two, Sufis as Warriors. Because this seems to confirm his idea of Muslims as basically terrorists. Uh, and he, he welcomed me then into kind of his circle of, of, of colleagues, which I found somewhat uh, amusing, but also somewhat disturbing. Uh, and I, it made me question, you know, this whole idea of the category of the Sufi as warrior. But I didn't really think about it seriously until I underwent research for another book altogether, uh, my book on Bengal, where, again, reading the biographies of Sufis, Persian biographies of Sufis, I discovered that uh, uh, there, too, there were Sufis who were identified with, with uh, militant warfare. But those biographies were all written in the, uh, in the 17th and 18th century. And then I went back to my, and I said, well, that's a problem because, you know, these books are, these biographies are written in the 17th century. They're talking about people who lived in the 13th century. Uh, there's 500 years between. Uh, that's a problem. You always want to use historical materials that are contemporary with the period that you are talking about. Um, and then I went back to my Sufi book, Bijapur book, and I realized that the sources I had used for my Sufis as warriors were not contemporary with the 14th century, when Alauddin Khilji was in South India, but they were written in the 17th and 18th century. And it made me think about well, what was happening in the 17th century, that both in Bengal and the Deccan, there is this idea that, that people had been warriors. Uh, and I gradually came to the understanding that this actually was a, a construction uh, that was a product of events that were taking place in the 17th century. So what was taking place in the 17th century? Well, in India, uh, by the 17th century, Muslim community had become uh, consolidated as a, uh, a self-identified whole um, with a large population of, 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 of villagers. And that awareness of an independent identity seems to be seems to, to cry out for a, a founder or some kind of founding mythology or story. So you had a number of these founders, um, and among them were these people who were conceived as uh, having a militant profile. In other words, I began to see this as a product of memory. And here you want to come to slide number five, please. The patriarch Moses or the patriarch Abraham, both of them, do not appear in written literature until the 6th and 7th century BC. Why is that? That is because in that, those centuries, the Jewish community was in exile in Persia and needed to formulate some sense of, uh, of consolidated identity and a, a foundation uh, story of who they were and where they had come from. And it is then that the stories of Abraham and Moses uh, were so very foundational for not just Judaism, but of course, um, Christianity and Islam. That is a time when they come into, into appearance. A similar thing can be seen more in more recent times. Uh, slide number six, please. Yes. In America, uh, Robert E. Lee became a kind of a larger than life hero uh, for thousands of Southerners, but not until, really, the 1920s. Uh, and you think in this statue that you see here, which is now being uh, challenged in, in uh, Charlottesville, Virginia, people who want to tear it down, that's another story. But it was constructed in 1924. But what was happening in 1924? In 1924, the average Confederate soldier who fought in the Civil War was around 80 years old. This is when these actual soldiers were beginning to die off. And so there was a need before they all die off to consolidate the memory of what they died for. And plus the, the, the need to consolidate a Southern identity that is, that, is, uh, that, is, that is free from the construction or the reconstruction 
or the fear of northern domination. So Robert E. Lee becomes this larger-than-life hero, even though he was a traitor, <laughs> committed treason against the country, tried to tear down the republic. Uh, so my point is that memory is a very important phenomenon in the way in which people conceive of the past. Uh, and I'm arguing here that in the case of Bijapur, uh, there was no contemporary evidence that Sufis were ever warriors, but it did become something that was constructed in the 17th and 18th century as the Muslim community began to think about its possible origins. In other words, my entire chapter two, I think now, is a, was a mistake. It's wrong, and it needs to be severely rewritten if I ever get around to writing a second edition uh, of that book. Slide number seven. So I began to think then about the, the other types that I portrayed in the Sufis of Bijapur. Uh, and the Sufis as reformers became one uh, dominant type. These were Sufis who undertook the task of influencing the state to do things that they thought were correct from an Islamic standpoint. Now, these people did not emerge, obviously, until the state had emerged. And so in the middle 16th century, uh, we have monuments like the Gagan Mahal in Bijapur, which is the principal palace uh, of the sultans. Uh, slide number eight. Or the great Jami Masjid, the Congregational Mosque, built uh, several years later, 1578, by Ali Adil Shah. In other words, the palace, the, the Gagan Mahal, uh, and the, 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 the mosque represent, respectively, the, the, the court uh, and the religious establishment. Uh, these two have now become thoroughly institutionalized by the middle 16th century. Uh, slide number nine, please. And then we have uh, in, important uh, sultans like uh, Ibrahim uh, II. This is the Ibrahim Rosa, built in 1627. Uh, this very famous monument, uh, slide number 10. Now, he himself uh, is depicted in contemporary paintings, not wearing armor, not with a sword, uh, but as you see here with musical instruments. Uh, uh, a stringed instrument on the left, uh, castanets on the right. Uh, he patronized, he was an extraordinary individual, contemporary with Akbar, uh, also contemporary with Jahangir. He patronized important Hindu festivals. Uh, he supported Hindu temples. Uh, he opened his, his important essay, the Kitab al Noros, which is an essay on Hindu aesthetics, uh, by praising uh, Ganesh. Indeed, he described his father as Ganesha and his mother as Saraswati. Uh, indeed, he, he, he brought into his palace a, an icon, uh, an image of Saraswati, and worshipped that image. Next slide, please. Slide number 11. On the left, you see uh, some of his art patronized by uh, Ibrahim II. That actually is an image of Saraswati. And the very top of the image, you can barely see it, uh, is an elephant, and that is Ibrahim Adil Shah himself on that elephant. So he very much identified with Saraswati, uh, of course, the goddess of knowledge and of music. Uh, and on the right, you see uh, an image of a, a yogini uh, with a minor bird. So he was fascinated with yoga as well. So this is a man who, who patronized... Uh, uh, eminent historians like Rafiuddin Shirazi or Firashta, uh, architects like Malik Sandal, uh, artists like Farooq Hossein, who painted uh, the one of, one of the possibly both of these images, and very famous poets like Nur ad-Din Muhammad Zuhuri. Slide number twelve. This was, it was under his reign that we see uh, a remarkable migration of Sufis coming to Bijapur. So this slide shows the whole reign from Yusuf Adil Shah, 1490 down to 1686, the end of the Sultanate. Uh, during the reign of Ibrahim II and his son Muhammad, uh, we find the majority of Sufis coming to Bijapur. So this is a very important period, very active, 
uh, very fertile in terms of, uh, of Sufism, but also in terms of poetry, of architecture, uh, literature of all kinds, and so forth. Uh, so as I read my books about the Sufis of Bijapur, the sources, I came to understand that there was a, a distinction between uh, Sufis who were born in the Deccan, wrote in Deccani, generally belonged to the Chishti order, and were uh, engaged with the rural classes of uh, the hinterland of Bijapur. And on the other hand, you have foreign-born Sufis who come from the outside, who belong to different orders, uh, who wrote not poetry but prose, uh, and, and these people tended to be the ones who were the reformers that I spoke of about uh, a moment ago. Next slide, please. Slide number 13. Yeah, so here's one such reformer, Shah Hashem Pir uh, uh, Alawi who in uh, 1626 uh, came back from a pilgrimage to Mecca. Uh, his ship was captured by the Portuguese. Uh, Ibrahim Adil Shah uh, uh, intervened with the Portuguese and got him to come to Bijapur. Uh, the Portuguese gave him back. And so he became very close to the court, obviously. <laughs> his, his, his life was saved in a sense by, by the Sultan. Uh, the next sultan, Muhammad Ali Shah, also patronized this sultan. In fact, he built the famous uh, 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 Gulgambaz tomb, the largest, one of the largest tombs in all of India, famous tomb of Bijapur, uh, right next to the Khanga or the dwelling of Shah Hashim Pir. Uh, so those two were very close, by, signified by the fact that, that their tombs are within only a half of a kilometer uh, from each other. So the point is that saints like, like uh, or Sufis like Shah Hashim Pir were close to the court. Uh, they used their influence in such a way as to uh, influence policy. Uh, in particular, some of the ones that were close to the court in the time of Ibrahim Adil Shah were unhappy with his devotion to the Hindu goddess Saraswati. And there are many stories about how they tried, they tried, but they failed uh, to to uh, dissuade him from worshiping Saraswati. Um, in any event, these reformers all cluster around, for the most part, uh, the period when uh, when Ibrahim was in power, and also his successor Muhammad, because this was the time when Sufis felt they had the most influence over the court. Uh, next slide, number fourteen. <clears throat> now you move beyond the walls of Bijapur, and that's important because the walls of Bijapur separate the court, obviously, from the, the hinterland. And about two or three kilometers northwest of the city walls, the outer walls, you have this hill uh, known as Shahpur Hillock. These are tomb shrines of, of three very, very famous Chishti Sufis. Uh, and these were people who were, were especially remembered for having written not only prose literature in Persian for their fellow Sufis uh, concerning the, 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 the Sufi path, but also poetry for ordinary villagers. And I became interested in both these kinds of literature because I found them to be something that was unique to this particular order. Uh, and so, uh, next slide, number 15, please. Here in very rough uh, and ready uh, sketch is the kind of outline that was most usually uh, 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 described by these Chishti saints of Shahpur Hillock. Um, most importantly, Burhanuddin Janam and his son Aminuddin Allah. The Chishti path, as you can see, uh, it, you have stages, exercises, different abodes, and different degrees from left to right. And then from top to bottom, uh, you have the beginning with, of course, the Sharia, which is, which is all Muslims uh, must obey the law. But then you move from the Sharia to the Tarigat, the way, the Hakigat, the truth, and the Marafat, or knowledge, 
Uh, all of this, of course, is aiming toward the ultimate goal, which is Tawhid, or union, which is the actual uh, direct experience of divine reality. Uh, in a sense, this path is, is not unique to Bijapur. Uh, different uh, uh, versions of pretty much the same idea is found in, in much Sufi literature. But this was the particular path that was propounded uh, by the Chishtis up there at Shahpur Hillock outside of Bijapur. Uh, but then there was another kind of literature which I want to talk about, which I was surprised to discover, because no one had ever described this ever before, uh, whether in India or anywhere else in the world. Uh, and that spoke directly to a fundamental paradox that I always was puzzled by, which is, you know, when people thought about Sufism, it's often described as being both the high and mystical tradition of Islam, which is intended for the few, but also the popular dimension of Islam as practiced by the unlettered masses. And it always struck me is, how do you overcome that paradox? If Sufis are only concerned with their own acquiring nearness to God, which is a very esoteric thing, uh, and they're writing in Persian. And it's a very elect few who can do this. How then does that bridge over to the masses of people uh, that that we find uh, associated with the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the popular dimension? And next slide, slide number 16. And what I discovered was that um, what you're looking at here is a, a uh, published, actually a lithograph, uh, early 20th century, uh, so-called Chakinama, which was written by followers of the Chishtis of Bijapur, uh, written not for fellow esoteric Sufis about uh, acquiring, you know, the, the, the discipline and austerities uh, that are associated with the Sufi path, but rather these were written for women, for village women, to be sung while they were undertaking ordinary household tasks, such as grinding the meal, that's the chucky, or next slide, slide number 17, the chakhanama, where they're at the spinning wheel uh, <clears throat> and uh, making thread. And you know, and this is a this is a great image because I, I always, of course, the spinning wheel has profound association with Mahatma Gandhi. We all know about that, uh, but here is a different kind of association, and that is with the Sufis have used the spinning wheel uh, as a vehicle for for talking about the the same path that you saw in that very esoteric slide uh, showing the different stages and different states. These are all translated, as it were, into the ordinary lives of village women to be sung to kind of coordinate their hand motions as they're either grinding the meal with the chucky or they're, they're making uh, thread from cotton, as they are in the charcha. And what's interesting is that this poetry, these poems, thus entered the households of villagers in the countryside. And it's not just the Chekhi Nama and Charcha Nama. You also have lullabies, or the Luri Nama. Uh, these were sung for, to children as you're rocking the cradle. Uh, so the children, the infants go to sleep. So literally, children are hearing this poetry from the cradle on upward and through their life. It's women, after all, who are in the household. Women are, the men are out there in the fields. The women are at home, and it's the women who raise the children. So it's very interesting that a kind of a Sufi culture can be seen to enter the households of rural Deccan through this, these kinds of mechanisms, uh, because it is women, after all, who raise the children. Uh, we speak our mother's tongue, not our father's tongue. And so this, I thought, was a very interesting discovery, because it seemed to suggest that this is one of the mechanisms by which this high... Um, esoteric, privileged, elite tradition of Sufism can become translated into uh, a mechanism and a culture which is already familiar 
to uh, women in the countryside. So this was this was very interesting. Uh, and it takes me then to the, the last topic I want to come to, uh, slide number 18, right, which is how Sufis related to the non-Muslims. Now, you recall this was always my original uh, aim in undertaking this whole study is, you know, can I ever get an answer to the question of conversion? And as I already mentioned, uh, that's com almost completely absent in any of the literature that I was able to find, whether it's the, the, the Tascarat literature, which is the biographical literature, whether it's the Malfuzat literature, which is to say the, 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 um, the, the conversations, that, the recorded conversations between Sufis and their followers, or whether it's the Malfuzat, the, uh, uh, the uh, Maktubat literature, which is to say the letters, uh, which were written by Sufis to their followers. And there's an enormous literature, Maktubat, uh, letters written by famous Sufis to their followers. And there again, I found no evidence of any interest in, in, uh, uh, in, in conversion or in the non-Muslim population, except for one line. Uh, again, Hashim Pir Alawi, who I've already mentioned before, who was close to uh, uh, Sultan Muhammad Adil Shah, who's tomb you see in the background here, the, the, the Gul Gambas. There's only one line there that makes one reference uh, to non-Muslims uh, reciting the Kalima, that is to say the, 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 uh, the, uh, the statement of faith, the, the confession of faith, uh, at the time that they swore allegiance to the, to the Sufi path. Um, and that, that stood out. But it stood out because it was the only one. So I'm still, I'm still puzzled as to how we can explain this general question of a conversion to Islam if we're only looking at the writings of the Sufis themselves for kind of high literature. I want to quickly mention two other uh, types of Sufis I discovered. One of these landed elites, I'm not going to talk about them very much uh, because they're not very interesting. Uh, they wrote nothing. Uh, they seem to have had no influence on society. They simply collected land revenue. But they were interesting by the very fact that this tells us something about society. Why is it that Sufis, who we think of as being people who reject the world, are now uh, uh, accepting land grants, whether it's Inam grants or Jagirs uh, from, from the Sultans? And many of them uh, acquired a great deal of land. Um, and I interpreted that as a sign of the kind of decline or the decadence, uh, not just of the tradition of Sufism in Bijapur, but really the decline of Bijapur itself, uh, when the state was trying to find allies anywhere. And uh, uh, the descendants of prominent Sufis were already known, uh, were already famous, and to acquire, you know, a certain degree of, of influence with the countryside, giving these people land was 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 way one way of doing that and then the final form uh, or type of sufi or social role that i discovered or wrote about uh were the dervishes slide number 19. um yeah this is an unknown or we don't have a name for him anyway uh this dervish uh in arabic majzub which simply means somebody who's attracted to god uh, so attracted to God that they uh, can behave in, in rather bizarre ways. Uh, these are people who are the, mo the most asocial uh, of all the types. Uh, they abandon the world altogether, indeed. And, and it's, what's interesting is that most of them appeared, again, like the landed elites um, or gentry. They, most of them also appeared toward the very end of the Sultanate uh, in the 16. 1650s and 60s and 70s, uh, about the time when the whole thing went down the drain. And it's interesting that that's when they appeared, because th this seemed to be, in a sense, a response to the, the, the complete social and political uh, dissolution that was going on in the late 17th century. The Mughals were coming down, and they had been threatening for, for years. Uh, they eventually conquered the dynasty. 
And these are people who basically see the world as a disaster anyway. And the only really safe thing to do, the only safe response is to get off the ship, uh, to retire from the world, to find a corner. In fact, the word uh, Gush Enishin in Persian simply means somebody who is sitting in a corner. Uh, or Majzub, another word, and many names for these people. Uh, and so it's their very asocial nature that that attracted me to this type of social role. And that's a certain paradox, because obviously they were not social actors at all. Uh, they had withdrawn from society. Um, and I want to close this discussion this morning, or this evening for you, uh, with a few words about the afterlives of these Sufis. And here we come to slide number 20. Yeah. Uh, it has to do with the, the, this powerful world word, uh, the Arabic word baraka, which simply means blessing. Uh, it really refers to the, the spiritual power or the spiritual charisma that some Sufis are, are, uh, believed to possess in greater quantities than other Sufis. In, in a sense, that would, that's really what distinguishes a saint or a wali uh, from uh, non-Sufis or non-saints. That is the, the possession of the spiritual power or authority, which is said, of course, to come directly from God. It's like, uh, it's like a magnet. Uh, People are attracted to this kind of spiritual charisma because these people are understood as being closer to God, and therefore one should take one's own cares or concerns to that Sufi. And importantly, when a Sufi dies a natural death, that baraka does not disappear. It adheres to the tomb that is built over his gravesite. Uh, and so, one sees in Bijapur, as indeed one sees everywhere in India, uh, especially on Thursdays, uh, throngs of people coming to receive uh, the blessings from the caretaker or the Sajjada Nasheen or, or the, the person who is, who is descended from that saint. Um, and you see from these images, especially women and children, and they could be Hindus or they could be Muslims. Uh, and so this photograph I took uh, at the shrine of Abdul Razak Ghadri, uh, one of the important shrines in Bijapur, uh, to illustrate the kind of afterlife of the Sufi, very important uh, in terms of, uh, of retaining, sustaining, and institutionalizing the Sufi tradition. Uh, next slide, number 21, please. Yeah, here you see an image of some women at the dargah of another shrine, Hamid Ghatri. Uh, and these devotees are receiving some kind of gift, it could be anything, who knows, uh, uh, from the, uh, the caretaker of this shrine. So in a sense, you have this continuity between the past and the present, between the life of the Sufi and the lives of ordinary people today, uh, visually depicted in something like this particular slide. Um, and then finally, uh, slide number 22, please. Yeah, I'm going to go back to, to Shapur, Shapur Hillock. This is the shrine of these Chishti saints uh, who lived about two and a half kilometers, three kilometers uh, outside of Bijapur. Uh, uh, three shrines in particular. Uh, Shah Milanji Shamsul Ashok, uh, his son uh, Amin Adin Allah, whose shrine you see here, and then uh, the, uh, uh, or rather the father of Amin Adin was Burhan Adin Janam, uh, the third one, who was also in this kind of these three shrines. Now, when I went to the shrine and uh, was discussing with the Sajjada Nasheen and others at the shrine, uh, what I learned was not only a great deal about the, the literature that was produced in the Adil Shahi period when Bijapur Sultanate was thriving, not only the literature written by uh, Sufis for fellow uh, 
uh, adepts, people who were undertaking the Sufi path, but also the Chakinama and the Chakhanama, uh, which were distributed for ordinary people. But I also discovered a very interesting document, which I'm going to close with, and that will be slide number 23. There you go. This is a, you could call this a Sosala or a Shajarat Nama, perhaps. Uh, I'm, I'm, in English, I'm calling it a certificate of membership, uh, but it's more than that. Uh, it gives you basically an entire chain. That's what Sosala means, it's a chain, starting from the Prophet Muhammad, who is named on the very top beneath the the, the credo of Islam, uh, there is no God but Allah, Muhammad is his prophet, that's what you see in Arabic at the top, and then in red uh, is the name of the prophet, and then what you don't see are all the success, spiritual successors between the prophet Muhammad and the, the most popular saint and most famous saint of the Deccan Plateau, Gisu Daraz. Uh, I didn't talk about him today because he was not in Bijapur. Uh, he lived in, in Gulbarga. Uh, and uh, died in 1422, uh, but his shrine is the largest and most famous Shishti shrine in all of the Deccan Plateau. So I picked up the, the Sosala uh, from Gisudaraz in 1422 and then continued it down through to Aminadine Allah. Aminadine, you see, is in the middle uh, uh, between Gisudaraz and the present day. And the the Shijra or the Silsila then continues all the way down to the, the present day, or at least the present when I was there, uh, where you have Sayyid Muhammad Farooq Hosseini, uh, who's list, whose name is on the very bottom. But the important part of this certificate is that you see some blank spaces. And the idea here is that anybody can enroll in this expanding uh, uh, Sosala, or chain of transmission of authority, of spiritual authority. Uh, and there's a blank space for your name to appear. There's a blank space for the, the month, uh, the day, and the year uh, which you uh, uh, swore allegiance to the, to the, to the, to the, uh, to the path of, of the Chishti order. And thereby, uh, you become, in a sense, uh, a, a part of this whole chronology. And I found this fascinating because it, this really illustrates very visually how it is that not just the Chishti order, but any Sufi order uh, becomes institutionalized and how it, 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 it guarantees the institution will continue into the future. Uh, and what you see here, I think, is very visually uh, how this takes place. So I'm going to, I think I've gone on now for about 50 minutes. And I'm going to bring this to a close. Uh, I'm sure you have questions, uh, but I just want to close with this thought that it, it's been very interesting for me. It's been a lot of fun, actually, to go back and, and reread my own first book with a view to discovering what I think is important about it and what I think is wrong about it. I mean, that's the great thing about writing books. The, 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 you, you, as time goes by, and you realize you've made mistakes, and it's important to encounter those mistakes and, 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 and understand, you know, why they were mistakes and how they need to be improved. In any event, uh, uh, these are some of the points that I thought were interesting and important about that book. And at this point, uh, I look forward to your own questions, your own comments, uh, whatever they might be. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for this wonderful and very engaging and enriching session. Uh, so my first question would be that Yusuf Said's Basant is a great example of religious syncretism through Chishti Sufism in India. Could you comment on the larger syncretic role played by Sufism with regard to religious festivals in ancient or medieval India? Do, do we see a continuity and invention in this particular syncretism today? Yes, I do. I, I, well, actually, that speaks to the, the last point that I was making in my, in my, uh, in my talk. Um, the festivals, I mean, one thinks of Sufi festivals, um, these shrines are very active. 
And when there are big festivals, they're all lit up. You have the lights, and, and there's and the Chishti ones in particular. There's music, um, and so these these festivals are structured especially around. Uh, I guess the most popular one, the most important one, is the uh, is the so-called Urs. Urs in Arabic means marriage. This, of course, commemorates the the death date of the Sufi. The word marriage, of course, implies that, that, that what's happening is the Sufi is being married to God. Uh, and uh, so I have been to various Sufi shrines when these occasions occur. For example, I was I was in Pak Patan in Pakistan when the Baba Farid, who was probably the most important uh, saint yes. of Pakistan, and he, he's the 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 Murshid or the teacher of Nizamuddin Olia, uh, who is probably the most famous uh, Sufi in, in in Delhi, as all of you know. Uh, so I had the good fortune of being at the Urs of Baba Sahib uh, at Pak Patan, um, and I, I just have to say it, it's a, it's a powerful experience. I mean, uh, that particular shrine has what they call the 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 Beheshti Darvaza, which is the the gate of heaven. And, and it's it's very low. It's only about three feet high, uh, it's, it, but it's only opened on the day of the Urs. And and people come from miles and miles around, um, Hindus and Muslims both, uh, because this is a point. I mean, if you think about it, the word Beheshti, the, 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 the Beheshti Darvaza is very, very important because the, the word heaven, Behesht, the Sufi shrine is the point where heaven and earth, in a sense, are meeting. And in a sense, people take their, their aspirations, their prayers, their hopes, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, a, a, some grand thing like salvation, moksha, or whether it's something simple like passing the examination uh, at, at your university. Uh, all these things are taken to the shrine. And it seems to me that um, when it comes to, if you talk about religious festivals, that is the one that I think is the most important and the most interesting uh, that we find across all of India, all of South Asia, indeed, all of the Muslim world. Uh, and so, yeah, that, that's how I, that's how I think, that would, how I would answer that. Right. Uh, you... In your presentation, you mentioned the, the relation of Sufis with the common people, with the non-Muslims. Right. So how did Islam adapt itself and amalgamate with the traditions prevalent in India during the time of its spread, the early time of its spread? What were the practices borrowed from the folk traditions of India at that time? Well, there are many ways that one can think about that. Um, I mean, one of the interesting things about Sufism anywhere is how it is adaptable to different cultures. For example, in West Africa, in Senegal, which where you have peanut plantations, uh, Sufis became identified with peanut cultivation, and and the the uh, and the idea of baraka was associated with the distribution of peanuts uh, in, in West Africa. I, I mean, in, in Central Asia, uh, Sufism merged with, with various cults oriented around uh, uh, mystical people, uh, Turkish traditions that had nothing to do with Islam necessarily. Um, so it's not surprising that in India, Sufis uh, used whatever was available in order to get their message across. I think that's my major point I want to say here, that, that, that for example, uh, in, the, in the 13th century, uh, many Sufis of Bengal were fascinated with uh, the traditions of yoga uh, and the, the, the uh, tantric yoga, especially, uh, and, 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 and uh, traditions of Brahmins that were preserved in Kamrup, northern, what, what is now Bangladesh. Uh, in the East, uh, and one saint in particular, uh, uh, Muhammad Gosam Gwalior, 
uh, went all the way from Gwalior in North India to Kamrup in order to get his hands on a Sanskrit text, the, the Amrita Kunda, which he then translated into the Bahrahayat, which means the Sea of Life. Uh, and this Persian translation of the Sanskrit text became wildly popular in India. Uh, and not just India. It, then it goes into it goes into Iran, into Anatolia, into Turkey, uh, where there are manuscripts found as far west as Istanbul. So my point is that that uh, at the level of elite Sufis, there is this 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 interest in 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 um, other attempts to attain transcendence, and obviously that's what yogis are do doing. Uh, yogis are doing the same thing. Uh, I mentioned already, you saw uh, Ibrahim Adil Shah II and his paintings of that, that yogini. Uh, so there's a fascination there that's already built in, uh, and you use that kind of thing to, to, uh, to intensify or to elaborate on your own discourse. At the popular level, um, Hindu culture was used in, in other ways. I'm thinking now of the uh, a very important 17th century Bengali uh, text, the, the Nobi Bongsho, written by Syed Sultan around 1640. Uh, Nobi Bongsho, of course, in Bengali means the, the family of the prophet. And, well, who is in the family of the prophet? Turns out that the prophet Muhammad is understood as an avatar of Niranjanan, which is the Sanskrit word for supreme god. And that included in the families of the prophet are, are Vishnu, Krishna, Shiva, uh, all as being seen as before the time of the prophet, as part of this bongsho, right? So there's a certain sense of continuity that, that is seen here. And I'm, I'm suggesting that, that, uh, uh, that, that epic works like the Nabi Bongsho, which is a huge work, by the way, 17,000 verses. Uh, and it's basically a an attempt to to make a, a Bengali uh, uh, version of the Quran itself, but it's a version of the Quran which has incorporated an enormous amount of Indian culture. One can look at the Primakan literature of of uh, in Eastern India. The the uh, the, Hindu, the earliest Hindi literature we have is written by people like Jayasi. Uh, Muhammad Jayasi in, in, uh, in uh, Padmavat uh, and his work which uh, which uses Indian uh, culture everywhere I mean it's, it's saturated everyone has an uh, Indian name uh, Indian sadhus and, 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 and what are, are, are all through the poetry so the, my, I, my point I'm simply making here is that it seems to me that Sufism has a particular uh, uh, ability to adapt itself to local cultures and take whatever happens to be there and use it in order to get its own message across. So, uh, yeah. it, it, it is safe to say that there was a slight impact of Chishtis and the Nakshbandis on the Mughals. Do we see any other cases in other region of India at that time that, you know, there was an impact on the rural class, the ruling class, or you know, there was a rivalry between the rulers and the Sufis? Well, the rulers and the Sufis, uh, <laughs> I have to say, there's always been a certain tension between the state and the Sufis. And the reason for that, I think, ultimately deals with the whole issue of sovereignty, of power. Who is sovereign, frankly? Is it the Sultan, who's up on this throne, uh, surrounded by powerful figures and, and dazzling architecture, and then and, and, uh, he, you know, he, he snaps his finger and the whole army moves? But Sultans are oftentimes corrupted. Uh, they have no piety, oftentimes. Uh, they have no blood, uh, royal blood. Many of them are just simply thugs or warriors who happen to be at the right time at the right place, and thus they establish a new sultanate. Uh, 
so you have their vision of uh, of of royal sovereignty, but then you have a divine sovereignty, which comes into conflict with that. Um, uh, Sufis, there's an enormous literature suggesting that Sufis thought that they were the ones who were really in control. Why? Because they were closer to God. They were pious. And sultans were not close to God. They were close to the army. And, and, and so you have this tension that's built in. Um, and one of my favorite stories here goes back to the 14th century when, uh, when the, uh, the future sultan, Giasadin, Giasadin Tugluk, uh, went to visit the, the descendant of Baba Farid in Pakpatan. Uh, only two generations away from uh, Baba Farid. And Giyasuddin brings with him his son, Muhammad uh, Tugluk, and his nephew, Firuz Tugluk, little boys. And the Sufi gave each of them a turban. To Giyasuddin Tugluk, he gave a turban that was four meters in length. To Muhammad Tugluk, he gave a turban that was 26 meters in length. And to Firuz, he gave a, a turban that was 37 meters in length. And that's all he did. The, but the symbolism was very clear. Everyone understood that each turban represented um, a crown. There's a very interesting dialect between the, the you know, the, 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 the Taj or a crown that's worn by a king and the dastar, or the or the turban that's worn by a Sufi, there's a certain sense that there's a, there's a similarity there, and the the length of these turbans represented the number of years which each sultan would rule. So in effect, what this Sajara Nasheen in Pakpatan was doing was he was predicting who would be on the throne of Delhi, but in another sense, you could say he was appointing them by assigning each one a turban whose length corresponded to the number of years that they would be on the throne of Delhi. So in other words, you, you have here this tension between saints and sultans. Uh, each one thinks that they're the ultimately in power, um, but that can get very dangerous. Uh, sometimes, for example, some Sufis, I'm thinking in particular, when Muhammad bin Tugluk does come into power, of Delhi, uh, Sufis who are not conforming to his, who, who are not serving as propagandists for the state, who do not propagate state policy, are seen as enemies, and some of them are actually executed by the state, given very cruel executions by the state. Um, or again, in the, in the, back in the Deccan, uh, when Firuz Bahmani uh, was Sultan. Uh, Gisu Dara, as I mentioned before, is the most popular saint in the Deccan Plateau. He got in trouble. And why did he get in trouble? Because Firuz wanted to appoint his own son to succeed him. He asked, he asked the saint, who is going to succeed me? And the saint Gisu Dara did not say his son. He said somebody else. And for that, he was banished. And he had to leave uh, the 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 uh, the area of the of the palace, and he li live outside the city. It's very significant that the Chishtis in Bijapur lived outside the city and not within the walls, because that again points to this tradition of Chishti, um, a certain antagonism between the the court and the and the, and the Sufis. So, it, to, to in other words, to, what I'm trying to say is. It's a complicated relationship because, in one sense, they need each other. Who is it that builds these magnificent dargahs and shrines, uh, uh, like in the uh, you've seen in, in Delhi at Nizamuddin, uh, or in in Pakpatan, or in in, in Bijapur? Sufis undertake an oath of poverty, right? The word fakir means one who is poor, yeah. so they're not going to build it. It's the sultans who build these shrines. And why do the sultans build the shrine? Because the sultan wants to be on the right side of people who are popular. 
Basically, they're politicians. And all politicians want to be popular with the masses. So if the if the Sufi is popular with the masses, then the Sultan wants to be popular as well. So what does he do? He builds a magnificent darga in 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 in, in you know in marble. And they're the ones who pay the bill. They're the ones who pay for the, the, these things. So in a sense, Sufism is is supported by the state because the shrines themselves are almost in every case built by state authority. And yet there is this tension between the Sufis and Sultans over the issue of power and who is ultimately an authority. So it's a, it's a great question. I'm glad you asked it because, you know, one could write many books about the, the intricate and, and very vexed uh, it, uh, relationship between uh, Sufis and, and rulers. Uh, now we'll take some questions from the live chat. Sure. This, this question is from Kiran Jadav. Her question is, were Sufis contributed directly or indirectly in the development of trade and commerce during the rule of Adil Shahi Sultanate of Bijapur? Yes. How did Sufis contribute to trade and commerce? Boy, that's a, that's a difficult question. Um, I'm not sure I can... Um, I, I'm not sure I can identify any direct connection between trade and commerce, uh, but certainly there's an indirect connection. And the indirect connection is that some of these shrines uh, became very wealthy. And... Um, and they became wealthy because they, became, they acquired land. Why did they acquire land? Because many of the sultans gave land to the descendants. Once again, the sultans want to be on the right side of the Sufis. Uh, they want to be seen as being uh, supporting people who are popular. Um, and one of the ways, they, another way they can support the, the shrine, apart from building the actual monument, is by giving them land. So the land becomes a major source of income for the shrines. Um, in in Pakpatan, the shrine that I studied in, when I was in, in Pakistan, the word for the, the leader of the shrine is Divan. Now, the word Divan is also the word for a finance minister, right? And, and so it's interesting that it, it, it's called that because the Mughal government would use the Divan of Pakpatan as a source of revenue, uh, and and uh, he was in a sense collecting taxes because a great much of the land that he was owned uh, was was given over to uh, was given back to the state. Uh, so there's a reciprocal relationship between the, the the state and the darga with respect to, to to land. One other thing is that. These people who are going to the Darga are themselves giving gifts called Nazar. Yes. And this, these gifts can be uh, anything, uh, but they are, they're obviously things of value. And in return for those gifts, the Sajara Nasheen or the, the, the leader of the shrine will give something in return, in back. And so there's a, there's a shrine becomes a, a point of circulation of wealth. Uh, going through the community wealth between the shrine and the people in terms of nazar uh versus just gifts from the from the shrine and wealth between the shrine and the state in terms of revenue so yes i would say there is a there is certainly a role in commerce that that one can identify uh the more i think about it thank you now coming over to the question of architecture i think just won't. Yeah. So now coming to the question of architecture, like Satya Peer and Bambini, Ban Bibi of South Bengal, do we find any syncretic idol in Bijapur? How far the Sufis of Bijapur influence the architecture of this particular place? Uh, let's see. Do we find any in syncretic idol in, in Bijapur? Uh, not that I know of. Now, of course, the word syncretic idol, uh, that, that is a, 
I'm not quite sure what is meant by that. If you mean an uh, an image that incorporates um, uh, aspects or themes that are derived from Islam, uh, I, I I cannot I cannot I have not seen that. No, I, I, I've seen that. I've not seen that kind of evidence. On the other hand, you mentioned Bone BB uh, and and Chattopir, uh in southern Bengal. Uh, now, there are images down there, which I have seen, uh, of these peers uh, depicted riding on a tiger, for example. Uh, and there's it's a fascinating relationship between tigers and Sufis in Bengal. Uh, maybe especially Bengal, because that's where we associate the Bengal tiger, obviously. But there's something about um, a Sufis in their in their in the aspect of their uh personality of power which is to say you know jalal is the word that we, or jalali is the, is the arabic word for for power where sufis demonstrate their authority uh and there are many many stories of sufis who can do things like taming the waters uh you have a raging flood uh and a sufi will, will come along and, and tame the flood and it's it's really controlling nature or riding a tiger. A tiger is obviously a symbol of power as well, and danger. And so riding tigers is another way of demonstrating a Sufi's uh, Jalali, or, or power. And so, yes, we do see images like that uh, in Bengal. Um, uh, but I've not seen that in the case of Bijapur. So, uh, there's a question as Philip Jude Fernandez. Wondering if you'll be able to observe the community, commonality of the Sufis with other cultures, faith, traditions, and etc. Well, uh, yes, of course. Uh, I, I, the most fundamental commonality, obviously, is the desire of, uh, of all great faith traditions to achieve some kind of transcendence. Uh, we all want to know if there's something bigger than this lousy, miserable, messy world that we live in down here on Earth. And to me, one of the wonderful things about India is the is the image of the of the of the lotus blossom, right, the Padma. Why is that such a powerful image? Because the lotus grows in mud, in muck, and it is a beautiful flower coming out. You know. And, 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 and uh, as a way of kind of showing triumph over the muck. And the, the lotus then is a symbol of transcendence. And it is not surprising then that we find an image of the lotus on not just Hindu temples, obviously, but on, <laughs> on mosques, on, on, uh, on, on Jain uh, temples, of course, on uh, Sikh, uh, uh, you know, Gurdwaras, uh, Buddhist, everywhere in, in Buddhist tradition. I mean, the, the, the Padma, the lotus, is a, is a symbol of transcendence and of triumph of, of the spirit over the, the, the messiness of, of the earth. And uh, that, to me, is, is absolutely what unites all religious traditions. And we see that in architecture, especially when, when, when you find, and I, I might add, going back to Bijapur, we're not gonna go back to those slides, but if you look at those, those slides of Bijapur, of the architecture, you will notice that they all, all the, the, the domes have on the bottom of them, the petals of a lotus. The same is true of the Taj Mahal. Uh, you can see at the very top of the Taj Mahal, uh, a similar kind of motif. Uh, but it's more pronounced in Bijapur than it is in North India. Uh, that is to say, the architecture almost imitates uh, vegetation. Uh, buds and, and petals and flowers are translated into stone. Uh, and we see that. Yeah, there you go. Good. Good example. This is the shrine of Shah Hashim Pir. You can see at the base of the shrine, uh, is a is a padma is a lotus the whole thing is coming out of that so that's that's my point is that we we see very clearly that illustrated in in uh, in, in 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 that tradition thank you 
I think this will be the last question link by Alkawa Nasir. Uh, you said that in chapter two of your book that your the Wadi interpretation of Sufi was somewhat not right. Then what are your views on Shahid Amin's interpretation of Sufi saint in his book Conquest and Community, the afterlife of Sufi saint Ghia Ghazimian? Well, that's a great question. Thank you for that question. I'm, I'm so glad you... Shahid Amin is a very good friend of mine and a colleague. Uh, I was I was privileged to, to invite him to Arizona, where he gave a lecture at my university, as I have given a lecture at, at Delhi. Uh, and... Um, I've always and I've always used his books in my classes. I might add, uh, his 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 book on, you know, the 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 riot of the police station uh, in, in the 20th century is, is foundational. But his most recent book about Ghazi Mian uh, really explores exactly the same question that I am really trying to deal with now in, in my discussion of these warrior saints. That that I I think that. Uh, uh, that Amin is absolutely correct in his study of memory, and his is uh, which is the same thing he did in his his, uh, his, his earlier study, um, and which is to say that memory is very it changes over time, uh, and different people remember the same thing differently at different at different places and different contexts, and the more you study history. The more you realize, and I think that this is one of the things that's fascinating about Shahid Amin, and certainly myself and my own research, I've discovered the same point. We think we are studying the past. What we're actually studying is the present. Because the present is what determines and, and kind of dictates what the past was. And of course, the there are many presents. There's the present that I'm speaking in at this precise moment, but there's also a present of, of 1855. There was a present of seven, 1722. There was a different kind of present in 1638. And each one of these moments has its own memory and therefore its own construction of the past. And, and I think this is really what distinguishes, in my own view, uh, a, a more mature and sophisticated historian from a, 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 a beginner is the understanding that, this, that the past is always unstable. This is disturbing for many students who would like the past to be all nice and tidy, wrapped up in a bow, and here, here's your past. This is what happened. It's all very simple. We all agree. We all know. It's very clear. And my word, to, my what I'm telling you is that's not so. Never believe that. The past is always constructed. It's always disputed. Uh, it's always changing, uh, and it's always a dialogue between our day and the distant past. Um, and that is why the study of history is so endlessly fascinating because we, we are we are always engaged in this debate, not just with ourselves. You know, I'll debate with other historians, but also we're debating with other historians of the past who lived in their present day. And their present day was very different from our present day. And both of the present days, of course, are hugely different from the moment that we're all trying to study. And that is why history is such a great topic. And I'm so happy that you guys, all of you, uh, have chosen to become historians and work on history. I and mean, I tell you, India is the absolutely most interesting place in the world for the study of history, not just because there's so much of it, but because it, more than most anywhere else in the world, continue to live in the present day. I mean, you can't get away from the past, as we all know. Uh, I mean, listen to Prime Minister Modi, who is constantly invoking the past. And I'm not going to get into politics right here and now, but we, we all understand that everybody is trying to control the past. And that, of course, is gets us into, obviously, politics, and that's where history becomes really, really, really contested. But nonetheless, as a professional um, uh, occupation, as an enterprise, 
uh, history, I think, is really the most thing, most interesting thing that anyone can study. So it's a great mm-hmm. pleasure to, my pleasure to interact with all of you people. Uh, it's It's been a real honor. I wish I were in Delhi right now, even though it's hot. Uh, but nonetheless, I'll, I will come and I'll let you know when I can do that. Okay. Sure, sir. So, Eva, sir, for this enriching session, it was truly an honor to host you this evening. And thank you, everyone who joined us live. Thank you again.